All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're very happy to have uh, Dan Capek from Harvard CMSA giving us a talk about shadows and soft exchange and celestial CFD. Thanks so much for accepting to give the talk, and please. Great, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss this work. Uh, so I'm going to discuss a paper that came out pretty recently with Prahar Mitra, uh, basically to do with infrared divergences and soft exchange in gauge theory and gravity, um, sort of a reformulation of some old results and putting them in context of some newer results. So I'm going to start with just a basic discussion about infrared divergences and soft exchange in gauge theory and gravity, and then I'll review some of the recent developments over the last couple of years that have um, reformulated old results about the infrared sector of gauge theory and the new sort of symmetry-based language. Uh, and then the second half of the talk will basically be describing this universal <sighs> model that sort of calculates soft exchange in higher dimensional gauge theories in terms of a lower dimensional sort of effective model. You could think of it sort of as a boundary model that computes uh, infrared divergences in these theories. Uh, so to start off with, uh, Infrared divergences is a very old uh, problem. So, you know, uh, the basic statement is that in any theory with long range forces, uh, scattering amplitudes in four dimensions with a finite number of photons or gravitons, they just vanish because of infrared divergences. So, formally, the way that these divergences arise is just from low energy virtual particle exchange between external legs. So I, I drew a couple of uh, uh, low order diagrams here, uh, but the physical interpretation of this divergence is really that the charged asymptotic scattering states in four dimensions are not just single particle states, but coherent states of charged particles and soft radiation clouds. So, you know, Although each of these diagrams is separately divergent in abelian models, that infinite sum actually exponentiates uh, and you get something that goes like e to the minus infinity when the infrared regulator is taken to zero. So the amplitude just vanishes. Um, so there's just zero probability to scatter into a state with a finite number of photons or gravitons in four dimensions. And that's, you know, the basic mechanism is known for, you know, almost 90 years is just the statement that the power radiated in the generic scattering process doesn't vanish as you go to zero frequency. So you have to produce infinitely many soft quanta in the scattering process. Uh, now in higher dimensions, that's actually not the case. So there the Coulomb field falls off fast enough so that you can actually define exclusive scattering states with finite numbers of massless quanta and you can calculate their transition probabilities and you get finite answers. <laughs> um, but in any dimension, uh, you can still sort of separate out, compute and exponentiate these soft contributions to the scattering amplitudes. Uh, and that's what we're gonna focus on in this talk. So we'll do a calculation which is valid in any number of dimensions but it will be only be in four dimensions where the result of that calculation is actually divergent and has sort of a more pressing physical interpretation. So the sort of usual orthodox approach to this problem is just to consider inclusive quantities. So you sort of do this trace over unobservable soft quanta in the initial or final states. Uh, so you calculate inclusive cross sections with arbitrary numbers of photons below some energy uh, and sort of order by order and perturbation theory, the sort of infinite volume of phase space available to those uh, soft quanta cancels with the infinities in the diagrams and you get finite answers. Uh, and that approach is totally sufficient for most experimental uh, purposes, but it kind of confuses two separate uh, physical phenomena. So, you know, uh, 
any experiment which human beings will create has a finite energy sensitivity and it simply can't detect photons of arbitrarily long wavelength. You know, the size of the detector sets some infrared cutoff. And in quantum mechanics, when you lack access to a particular component of the Hilbert space, you have to take some partial trace over the part of the system that you can't explore to get some reduced density matrix. So any collider observable in any number of dimensions has to include some trace over the unobservable quanta. But the unobservable scale in that calculation is really set by detector sensitivity, not by the infrared divergence. So, you know, you could have a higher dimensional collider with a very bad detector and you need to trace over relatively short wavelengths, which are certainly produced in a generic scattering process. Um, and you need to do that inclusive calculation for the collider observables, but it's not related to any infrared divergence because the exclusive cross sections are totally well defined in higher dimensions. Okay, and so the only place where this is really a pressing question is if you want to discuss sort of fine grained questions like unitarity or the information content of soft quanta, because in that case you actually need access to the quantum mechanical transition amplitudes in the Hilbert space. Uh, and so I, you know, I just want to kind of emphasize that the difficulty in defining an S matrix in four dimensional asymptotically flat space is really a deficiency in our formalism. It's not, you know, a physical statement that the S, no S matrix can exist in four dimensions. The formalism that we've set up just does not apply, strictly speaking, in four dimensions. There are exact transition probabilities. And the sort of key physical uh, idea for the solution of this problem was made roughly 50 years ago by Chung, Kibble, Fadeyev, and Kulish, um, although it's really not been well-developed and doesn't receive a lot of attention because the inclusive approach is sort of sufficient for most practical purposes. But the basic idea of these authors was just that the asymptotic Hamiltonian, which controls the early and late time evolution of scattering states is not a free Hamiltonian in four dimensions, essentially just because the Coulomb field does not fall off uh, fast enough in four dimensions. So in the charged sectors of the Hilbert space in a theory like quantum electrodynamics, this Hamiltonian has matrix elements that connect states with different numbers of photons. So if you want a stationary state that's invariant under early and late time evolution, it basically has to be a coherent state that uh, has infinitely many photons in the state. So, you know, some of the formalism for computations with these dress states was set up back in the 70s, but they're usually very cumbersome and they also appear to be plagued with lots of ambiguity. So I think anybody who's actually looked carefully at this subject doesn't really feel that it's at a satisfactory state. I think the path is more or less clear, but the problem has certainly not been solved yet. Um, but over the last couple of years, there were many uh, results on infrared effects in gauge theory and gravity um, that have been sort of reformulated as consequences of symmetry structures of gauge theory and gravity in the Coulomb phase. Uh, so the sort of story began when people found a way to formulate the soft theorems that appear in gauge theory as uh, sort of ward identities for gauge transformations with non-compact support. Uh, and it's sort of been evolving over the last couple of years, but it's really a part of a program that's trying to get some sort of handle on the holographic dual of asymptotically flat space-time. So the first thing that you'd like to understand in a dictionary like that is just the symmetry structure on both sides, because symmetries have to match in any duality. And one of the important lessons that's uh, come out of all of this work is that the sort of dual formulation to asymptotically flat space seems to be intrinsically D minus two dimensional, which is a little bit different than uh, how it works in anti de Sitter space. Uh, but I hope I can give you a little bit of a taste for why this is the case. Uh, but anyway, so there are indications that this, this sort of new symmetry braced uh, approach 
which involves these celestial scattering amplitudes and the conformal basis is an appropriate formalism to address the IR divergences. So some of this old work by Fadeyev and Kulish, Gibble and Chung actually looks very natural uh, when you put it through this formalism and it seems that some of the ambiguities are resolved. So that's sort of the reason that I'm interested in this question. I'm not actually going to address the form of these asymptotic dressed states in this talk. Um, so we're going to sort of get halfway there. We won't finish the story, but we will have a very clean and interesting uh, reformulation of the infrared divergence problem in any dimension. And hopefully that's going to be enough to help us solve this very old problem. So I can uh, ask a quick question then. Yeah, yeah, am, I, am I understanding this correctly that in higher than four dimensions, there is no real conceptual problem, right? Because we don't need the coherent states, right? So, but there's still, you're saying that there is this mathematical structure present there, even <laughs> in higher than four dimensions, but our, our formalism is adequate, right? Is that right? Yeah, the formalism to compute the perturbative S matrix in more than four dimensions is adequate. Um, it's not necessarily the formalism that would uh, make it clear what a holographic formulation of the system should be. Uh, as I'm going to describe in a couple of slides, uh, you know, there's kind of a almost tri trivial rewriting of uh, the S matrix in any dimension, which sort of reinterprets the Lorentz group as the conformal group on the sphere at uh, the conformal boundary. And you can sort of write a lot of very suggestive formulas that make the S matrix look like a conformal correlation function sort of evaluated at SCRI, which is the type of thing that we encounter in ADS CFT. Um, so what's going to be interesting about these results that I will discuss is that we have literally a Lagrangian model, which is d-dimensional instead of d plus two-dimensional, which computes exactly soft exchange to all orders in any number of dimensions. So it's kind of like an extra step in this direction of understanding what is d-dimensional about d plus two-dimensional gauge theory. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, so uh, what are these recent uh, developments that I'm referring to, uh, most infrared effects in gauge theory and gravity are universal. Uh, and universal effects usually have symmetry explanations. So the simplest example that I know is the self photon theorem. So this is written in a little bit non-standard notation, but the left-hand side is just a scattering amplitude with n plus one particles, one of which is a photon, which I call O sub A. And the soft theorem says that when you take the wavelength of that photon to be very large, so its energy is very small, uh, this amplitude factorizes into a reduced amplitude that does not involve any photons. And this universal soft factor, which basically only depends on the external long distance quantum numbers of the scattering states. Okay, so the basic physics behind this formula is just that when the wavelength of the photon becomes much larger than any other scale in the problem, it can't resolve the short distance interactions anymore. So it can only sort of see these long distance conserved quantum numbers, and that's what it couples to. And that's why you get this universal factorization formula. As I said, in that limit, the amplitude factorizes. And what you get is a linear relationship between a matrix element with and without a photon. And that is reminiscent of a word identity. So what, what could that word identity correspond to? What is the symmetry uh, explanation of the word identity? Now in gauge theory, gauge transformations with compact support, so gauge transformations which go to zero at the boundary, those are redundant descriptions of the same physical state. Sorry, can, all... I, can I ask you a quick question? Sorry for sure. interrupting. Um, mm. So in, the, in this, uh... Can you go on a slide back? What if two, two of the photons are very uh, long wavelength? What happens there? Yeah, so in abelian theories, if you had another photon operator and you took them to be simultaneously soft, uh, you'll just get another one of these soft factors. So in other words, the abelian 
limits all commute and you just get, I'll have a formula actually for that later because one of the things that we want to be able to reproduce is the multi-soft. Wonderful. Uh, in a non-abelian model, like uh, a uh, non-abelian gauge theory, if you take uh, gluons to zero momentum, uh, it matters the order in which you take it, basically, because there's an, still a non-abelian structure, even in the soft limit. So in abelian gauge theory and in gravity, the soft limit is essentially abelian, because even though gravity is a very non-linear force, its charge is energy momentum. So when you go to zero energy, it's effectively abelian. And in those examples, you just get basically products of these soft factors, but it's much more complicated in non-abelian models. Thank you. Okay, uh, so gauge transformations with compact support, they're just redundancies. You don't assign any physical significance to them, but the ones with non-compact support are different. So they change classical boundary data, and in quantum mechanics, they act on the physical Hilbert space. So much of the previous work in this direction went into establishing a claim that goes like large gauge symmetries, which you know, we will make more specific later. They are spontaneously broken on the perturbative vacuum and the soft theorems are just consequences of these symmetries. So in the case of quantum electrodynamics, the large gauge symmetry basically just comes from doing gauge transformations which have non-trivial angular dependence at spatial infinity. So if you do a gauge transformation which is constant at spatial infinity, that's just a global charge rotation. That's just a global U1 rotation. You know that's physical because there is a physical conservation law associated to the U1 charge in electrodynamics. But there are also uh, gauge transformations which have non-trivial uh, angular dependence at the boundary. And you can write down a current which generates those transformations. So it has this form. It's basically an exact form, which means that it's trivially conserved. D star J is equal to zero, since it's already an exterior derivative. And this epsilon is just a function which has angular dependence at spatial infinity. Okay, so the charge uh, associated to these transformations is just an integral taken at spatial infinity of the electric field weighted by this function of the angles on the sphere. <clears throat> so the sort of one minute cartoon for how these calculations go is that because this current is conserved, you can evaluate the charge either at spatial infinity out here using the Stokes theorem, or you can evaluate it as a three-dimensional integral on scry plus or on scry minus, okay? So this would be like acting on the out state of the scattering uh, amplitude. This is like acting on the in state. Charge has to be conserved, so uh, that gives you a conservation law. And then if you look how this three-dimensional charge acts, the first term will be basically a time-like integral of the electric field. So that creates essentially a zero momentum photon. So that's the left-hand side of the soft theorem, which involved a photon whose energy was taken to zero. The second term in this current, this one here, which is epsilon d star f, that's just related to the flux of uh, electric charge through null infinity through the Maxwell equation, okay? So that basically gives you the right-hand side of the soft theorem, which knew about the charges of the external states, okay? So that's sort of the cartoon for how this calculation goes. Most of the work uh, goes into converting um, variables from one null cone, which is the momentum space null cone, to another null cone, which is the conformal boundary. So scry plus, scry minus, and spatial infinity. And it turns out that these two null cones are basically interchangeable. So for the rest of the talk, I'm always gonna work in momentum space. And that's where all of the sort of co-dimension two nature of the model is going to come from. But you should keep in mind that this momentum cone is really the same thing as the uh, conformal boundary to asymptotically flat space, okay? <clears throat> okay, so, you know, 
In particular, one way in which those two cones are the same is that the Lorentz group acts the same way on spatial cuts of both of those two cones. So if you take a space-like slice of the momentum cone and then you act with Lorentz transformations, so here's a space-like slice, this little circle that I've drawn, it, the Lorentz group acts as a conformal transformation on this space-like slice. The same is true in asymptotically flat space. The, the space-like transverse cuts of future and past null infinity, which are also uh, spheres, uh, they are acted upon by the Lorentz group as the conformal transformations of the sphere. Okay, so one way to just, you know, if you, you want to see it in equations, you have the, the normal Lorentz generators, which I'll call M. You can take particular linear combinations of those Lorentz generators to make these operators J, D, T, and K. And the Lorentz algebra implies that these other generators satisfy the Euclidean conformal algebra. Okay, so the J's generate the Euclidean rotations, T and K are the translations and the special conformal translations, and D is the dilation operator. Okay, so, so the idea is really going to be that the Lorentz group is going to be interpreted as a sort of D-dimensional structure rather than a D plus two-dimensional structure acting on the, the sphere at infinity. And that's where these kind of boundary formulations are meant uh, to live. <clears throat> okay, so the fact that the Lorentz group acts on momentum. Sorry, just can I ask yeah. a quick question? Yeah. But the uh, it's a Euclidean conformal group, right? Yeah, that's, that's going exactly. to be key, right? Yeah, yeah, it is going to be an intrinsically Euclidean conformal correlator. It's not really even clear what the Lorentzian continuation of these correlation functions would mean. Um, but even because the boundary is null, so yeah, okay. That's right. right. The boundary is null, but I'll show you in a minute. What is done is basically in order to get operators which actually diagonalize the dilation operator, you, you do an integral transform over the null direction, the sort of Fourier transform in the energy. And that gives you actual conformal primary operators, uh, but you're left with basically D dimensions instead of D plus one dimensions. But now That's, things yeah, are labeled yeah. by a conformal dimension, which is like the proxy for the extra dimension. Right, right. Uh, yeah, so, so just to say uh, in equations, we have a general null momenta. There's a very convenient parameterization in terms of an energy, which I'll call omega and a D dimensional coordinate. So if it's a null momentum, I just need omega and uh, this d-dimensional space-like cut of the null cone to describe a general point of null momentum. If it's massive, then you basically just add uh, an extra vector, which depends on the mass to the null momentum, and that parameterizes the most general uh, momentum for a particle in d plus two dimensions, okay? And the Lorentz group is going to act on these coordinates x as conformal transformations. Okay, and so in, in these variables, the Lorentz invariant inner product is basically just the distance in this d dimensional space plus some extra constant terms if the particles have mass. Okay, so what I want to do is basically take the standard uh, scattering amplitude with in particles and just kind of rewrite it in a trivial way, but very suggestive way by defining these operators, which will depend both on X and on Omega to just be the creation or annihilation operators that are involved in the definition of this scattering amplitude. Okay, so I can just, I am free to rewrite the scattering amplitude in this form as a correlation function of a bunch of these operators. And that's just simply a rewriting of the scattering amplitude. Uh, but Lorentz invariance fixes the transformation properties of these operators O. So it's sort of a textbook uh, definition that M, when it acts on the creation or annihilation operators, just acts with the factor of the orbital angular momentum, which is determined by the momentum and derivatives with respect to the momentum, along with the spin piece. Okay. So you can take that formula and just transform it into these uh, conformal variables and ask how the operators transform 
uh, with respect to the Euclidean conformal algebra. Okay, and this, okay, these formulas may not be familiar to you, but it's actually the transformation law for a d dimensional conformal primary operator and conformal field theory in d dimensions. Okay, so the translations just act like derivatives, rotations obviously act like d dimensional rotations, special conformal transformation. The, Transformation is a little bit messier, but it is correct. And the only real uh, difference is that the operator D is not diagonal in the usual momentum space uh, basis. You see, normally for a conformal primary operator, this omega D omega term would be just the conformal dimension of the operator. But since momentum eigenstates are not boost eigenstates, uh, these operators do not have fixed values of delta. But you can fix that basically by doing a Mellon transform with respect to the energy. So you take some integral transform of the operator with respect uh, to omega, and you can check that this operator actually does have a well-defined scaling dimension. So in particular, it's S matrix elements, or you want to think about them as conformal correlation functions, they will transform exactly the way that operators transform in a normal Euclidean d-dimensional conformal field theory, okay? So this is what people sometimes call the conformal uh, basis or the celestial scattering amplitudes is after you do this transform. Um, okay, and for, for massive particles, the transformation is a little bit more complicated, but it's uh, still relatively easy to do. <clears throat> it just involves basically an integral over this bulk to boundary conformal, uh, sorry, the bulk to boundary propagator uh, in Euclidean anti de Sitter space. So you can think of that as basically being the mass hyperbola for a uh, massive momentum of fixed mass. And then you kind of uh, integrate from some point on the sphere down to all of those points in the Euclidean ADS, and that gives you a conformal primary. <clears throat> right, so as I said, K is just the, uh, the bulk to boundary propagator in Euclidean hyperbolic space, and this is what people usually mean when they say the conformal basis for scattering amplitudes, okay? So you know, that's a lot of information. Really, the important point to take away is that you can rewrite the S matrix in a way that looks very much like a d-dimensional conformal correlation function. So there are indications that there is sort of something d-dimensional about the d plus two-dimensional S matrix. And that's what we want to explore in sort of a concrete example with these infrared divergences and the soft exchange. Is there any questions before I go on? Uh are you comment? Are you going to comment on the fact that here delta is probably a continuous variable, right? That's right, because you're sort of uh, Fourier transforming along a non-compact direction. Delta actually sits on these values, which look like the principal series for the conformal group. So it, is, it is, is that not... going to be an important issue? Because in comparison to ADS, say that's right. significantly different, right? So it's not going to be important for me because I'm not actually going to take this uh, transformation. So the infrared divergence is actually kind of more confusing to think about when you integrate over energies of all scales in the uh, in the scattering state. So I'm not going to work with this basis and this basis will not be important for what I do, but it is an important uh, distinction between asymptotically flat space and anti de Sitter space. So it's, you know, if there is actually some type of Euclidean conformal field theory, which, you know, sort of from first principles computes the S matrix and asymptotically flat space is going to be a very non-standard one, which does not have the normal features like, you know, discrete spectrum, real eigenvalues, da da da, that, that we're familiar with from anti de Sitter space. So that, that is an important distinction for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, ask, uh, uh, yes. go, go ahead, Professor Kratzinski. Uh, no, no, I, no, sorry, I, I wanted to understand what assumptions go into this. So you are saying that the, so the photons at the 
infrared, I like a free theory, so it's that important, but, the, but then you have an interacting theory that you don't know, that you are probing in the infrared with photons, or are you using that there is a free theory somewhere here, or this is questionary? Uh, no, so this, this is really just sort of an algebraic operation, so you can just check that if you take this definition and you uh, plug it into the commutation relations for the Lorentz group that this operator will formally transform like a d-dimensional conformal primary. So that's a statement about kinematics. It's independent of dynamics. Uh, there's a separate question about whether or not the model that you are using has appropriate UV and IR behavior. So that's a dynamical question such that this integral transform converges and gets no, but i mean the, the previous the, in the same page the previous equation like oh why how does it transform oh these these equations up here they're those that's completely general so that's just you put in that you have a lorentz invariant uh local quantum field theory and these statements follow immediately that's totally universal so it doesn't depend on the infrared because you say if it's non abelian for example uh, the, these, yeah, these these will still be true. Uh, oh, okay. These, okay. these those are supposed to be the actual asymptotic scattering states, and unless you have you know spontaneously or explicitly broken Lorentz invariants, these formulas have to be uh, true for any quantum field theory. Okay. Thank you. But the correlation functions of these operators depend heavily on dynamics, whether or not it's infrared free or or whatever. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I have a, a basic question. Um, I'm confusing myself about this commutation relation. Um, so I thought you're thinking of Euclidean uh, conform group on uh, momentum space, basically. But yeah. you have this operator O that has um, X in which I guess is position. Um, yeah. I'm confused with this, um, how this O relates to this momentum space. Yeah, so this, this O, just think of it as a, as a creation or annihilation operator where omega okay. and X label a point on the null cone. So they, they label a particular momentum. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that, so the X's are basically coordinates on this space-like cut of the null cone. Mm -hmm. And oh, the okay. group acts as the Euclidean conformal group on this space-like cut. So it both acts on omega and on this space like cut so that the full thing transforms like a d plus two dimensional vector under the Lorentz group but if you mm -hmm. ask just how do the coordinates of the space like cut transform then it then it behaves like a coordinate for euclidean conformal group in d dimensions ah uh, okay i see thank you mm -hmm. sure Great. <laughs> okay so I'm going to just rephrase the soft photon theorem in these variables uh, because we're going to need that obviously when we discuss the infrared divergence. So I already showed you this formula. It just says that when you take the sort of zero energy limit of a photon, you get this nice factorization in the correlation functions. So I'm going to basically cook up an operator which isolates this one over omega pole. Uh, in this correlation function. So I can either do it by using a contour around the origin that isolates the residue, or I'll just multiply it by omega and send omega to zero. Either way, uh, you can show that this soft operator will have scaling dimension delta is equal to one. And you can calculate this correlation functions exactly precisely because you know the soft photon theorem. So his correlation functions would just factorize into this reduced amplitude without the soft operator times this universal factor curly J, which you can write as the derivative of a logarithm. So that's just another way to rewrite the soft factor in the top formula. Okay. So that's going to be a very important formula for later. Uh, now, in basic examples of uh, the holographic principle, bulk gauge symmetries always map into global boundary symmetries. So that means that the sort of global part of the gauge group is physical. Now, in a conformal field theory in D dimensions, 
global symmetries come with a spin one dimension D minus one conserved primary operator. So conserved current, which satisfies a very simple Ward identity. So you take the divergence of this conserved current. It has to be zero everywhere that, that there is not some charged operator sitting there. Okay, so it only has the divergence of the current only has contact uh, point uh, singularities only support at coincident points. Uh, the coefficient has to be fixed by the charge of that particular operator and there's delta function support there. Okay, now this is not quite the soft photon theorem, but it is very closely related because if I take this formula and I just multiply by the derivative of a logarithm on both sides and then take an integral, well, then I'll just use the delta function to do the integral and I'll get the derivative of a logarithm term, which I just showed you was exactly the matrix element of the soft operator. So I have a statement that says the soft operator is equal to sort of this uh, non-local integral transform of a derivative of the current. Okay. So if I just integrate by parts, I can write the soft operator as integral transform with this kind of funny kernel times the current. Okay, this IAB is basically a formally covariant tensor. It's sort of the only thing with two indices that you can write down that transforms correctly under the conformal group in this case. Uh, and this non-local relationship between a dimension one primary operator and a dimension D minus one primary operator is actually known in conformal field theories. It's called the shadow transform, okay? So the, the more general shadow transform takes a dimension delta spin S primary operator and it maps it to an operator with a different scaling dimension, dimension D minus delta, but the same spin, okay? So it's always just given by this integral with the kernel, which is basically a bunch of factors of this conformally covariant tensor weighted by some uh, power of the separation between the operator and the argument. Okay, so this, this uh, shadow transform is known. It doesn't really have a particular physical interpretation in normal Euclidean conformal field theories that we are familiar with, but it seems to show up a lot uh, in these discussions of the celestial correlation functions and the uh, and the conformal basis for the S matrix. And we're going to see it again when we work out the infrared divergences. So one important property of the shadow transform is that if you do it twice, you get back the same operator. Okay, so you map something with dimension delta to dimension D minus delta back to dimension delta. Okay, and so once we know that we can just take this relationship that said that the soft operator was the shadow transform of the conserved current to say that the conserved current is just the shadow transform of the soft operator up to some numerical factor which is not very important and it's just there to get the contact terms uh, with the correct normalization. Okay, so the basic statement that I want you to take away from this discussion is that the leading soft photon theorem in any dimension implies the existence of a d-dimensional uh, conserved current, which obeys all of the word identities that you would want from a conserved current in a conformal field theory in dimensions d. And you can calculate its correlation functions in this model, um, and the factorization property still holds, and you basically just get a shadow transform of this derivative of a logarithm uh, that we had from the soft photon theorem. Okay, so normally in holographic models, you have bulk gauge symmetries which give you uh, global symmetries in the boundary, and those global symmetries have special operators like conserved currents, and the exact same thing seems to happen in asymptotically flat space. Um, Wait, can I ask you a naive question? Yeah, sure. So if I have a Conformal field theory. Let's say I, I'm not thinking about uh, flat space at all. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not thinking about scattering. I have conformal field theory, and let's say I have a conserved current. Mm -hmm. um, the shadow transform of the conserved current is 
something nice? Does it have a nice physical interpretation? No, normally people wouldn't consider such an operator because it's sort of below the unitarity bound and it doesn't show up in nice unitary conformal field theories that we're typically interested in if we're studying statistical models or something like that. Um, here, you sort of, you're handed this operator with dimension one, which is a weird scaling dimension for a general conformal field theory. Uh, and it's really the shadow transform of that operator, which gives you the interesting physical operator that you would expect. Sorry, I'm only confused. The shadow transform of a local operator is highly non-local, right? It looks highly non-local. And the surprising, the surprising thing in this story is that actually both the shadow transform of S and S itself have local correlation functions. So I don't, I don't know that there's any guarantee of that in a generic conformal field theory, but in these examples, um, you take S, which has normal looking correlation functions, you do this shadow transform and you get something which still behaves like a local operator. So that's a little bit of a surprise, but it seems to hold in most examples that people have worked out in this, uh, in this subject. I see, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, one one point which won't be super important. Sorry, sir, I'm just going to ask another question. Yeah, but I mean, here here we're talking about the Euclidean uh, CFT, right? So there's no interpretation for a unitarity bound or anything of that type, right? Exactly. That's why it's not it's not forbidden. It's what is handed to you by the d plus two dimensional S matrix. It's just something which we wouldn't, you know. People haven't encountered it because the garden variety conformal field theories that we like to study and that we understand rigorously and mathematically uh, do not have the type of properties that you need to be able to reproduce an S matrix. Thank you. Are, are you going to comment on like whether do you, do you have in mind some sort of stat mech interpretation for this because this theory is non-unitary or is, is it just Euclidean or? Is, I think it's it's a lack? totally it's a totally open question what what the sort of first principles d-dimensional definition should be. So, so right now, most of the work goes in taking d plus two-dimensional answers and sort of translating the results and seeing what they look like in terms of d-dimensional variables. So what I'll do, uh, hopefully I'll be there in a couple of minutes, is to write down an explicit Lagrangian model in d-dimensions, which computes d plus two-dimensional uh, soft exchange. So in that example, is just, well, you know, in the abelian case, it's just a compact boson. In the gravity case, it's a little bit more complicated, but there's still a relatively simple Lagrangian for it. Um, but in terms of the full model that computes the full S matrix, I, I don't think anybody really even knows what to expect. It's a wide open question. I see. Thank you. Okay, let, let me skip this. Uh, it's just a statement that things are a little bit different for massive <laughs> particles. Um, the important point is that uh, the exact same story, which I've just described in abelian gauge theory, actually holds in gravity. So gravitational theories also have a soft graviton theorem and a sub-leading soft graviton theorem. So there's sort of two universal pieces in the expansion of matrix elements involving gravitons. And you can show basically that the shadow transform of the leading soft graviton operator actually just produces for you d plus two abelian currents, which are associated to the global translation symmetry in asymptotically flat space. And if you look at the subleading soft graviton operator and you study its shadow transform, you get an operator which satisfies all of the word identities of an energy momentum tensor in a d-dimensional conformal field theorem. So that's exactly the way that it works in anti de Sitter space. There, you need a fluctuating graviton in the bulk gravitational system in order to produce an energy momentum tensor in the boundary model. And that works exactly the same uh, in asymptotically flat space, which I think is a big hint. Okay, so just to summarize very quickly, there's a natural way of rewriting the d plus two dimensional S matrix in terms of d dimensional conformal correlation functions. All of the universal soft theorems in gauge theory and gravity give you universal operators like currents and stress tensors. The current is always the shadow transform of the soft photon. 
Uh, yeah, and that, that's basically what, what we want as background. And now we're going to try to, to understand how infrared divergences and soft exchange fit into this d-dimensional story. Okay. Can I can ask another question. Yeah, um, so am, am I understanding this correctly that if we're doing Euclidean ADS-CFT, uh, the boundary theory will have a symmetry group SOD comma one, and you could realize that as symmetries of Euclidean ADS, or in this case, you could realize it as a Poincaré group of uh, Minkowski space, right? Uh, Poincaré group of Minkowski space? Lorentz group, sorry, I, I misspoke. Um, I think it should have, Euclidean ADS would have the same symmetries as the Euclidean d-dimensional sphere, right? Um, yeah, so it, it, so, um, so ADSD plus one has uh, SD as the conformal boundary, and then the the ADS group acts as conformal rescalings of that. Oh, all right, 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 right. Sorry, sorry, never mind. Right, right, sorry. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, so infrared divergences uh, is kind of a textbook subject. There's lots of different and equivalent methods for regulating and canceling the infrared divergences and scattering amplitudes. One common approach, and the one that I'm going to use, introduces a hard infrared cutoff, uh, which I'll call small mu for the photon. And what that means is that when you do loop integrals, the loop integrals are performed in the range omega is larger than mu. Okay. And then typically what you do is to choose a second scale lambda, which is not the IR cutoff, but it's supposed to be sort of the barrier between hard particles, which have energy greater than lambda, and soft particles, which have energy less than uh, lambda, but by definition greater than mu because we have an IR cutoff. Okay. And the point is that if mu and lambda are taken to be much smaller than any other energy scale in the scattering amplitude, then you can actually compute exactly the contributions from this piece of the integral and exponentiate them and get an exact uh, answer for the soft exchange in this range of energies. Okay. So in equations, what that means is if you have uh, a scattering amplitude with an IR cutoff mu uh, and you do the loop integrals over all energies greater than mu, that's the same as having a scattering amplitude with an IR cutoff big lambda and you where you only integrate over energies greater than lambda times this exponentiated factor e to the minus gamma and gamma depends on both scales mu lambda and all of the quantum numbers of these external scattering states okay so this is a statement about uh, soft factorization and the exponentiation of soft exchange in abelian gauge theory. The same thing is true in uh, gravitational theories, as I said, because their infrared sector is effectively abelian, but this is a much trickier uh, topic and not abelian gauge theory. Okay, so gamma can actually just be calculated from exchange diagrams between the external legs. Uh, of the scattering amplitude. So this is so you basically get one soft factor from attaching a photon to one leg, another soft factor from attaching a photon to another leg, and then you integrate over the phase space for the photon over the virtual loop momenta, and that gives you gamma. Okay. Uh, so you only do the integral in gamma over the, the energy range that represents the soft quanta, so the energies between mu and lambda. Uh, and basically, the point is that you can take that contribution and separate it out in any dimension. It will only be when small d is equal to 2, so four dimensions, that that contribution is infrared divergent. But you can actually calculate it and exponentiate it in any number of dimensions. Uh, so for us, it's going to be useful to have a sort of expression for gamma in terms of our d-dimensional variables. So there's going to be an overall factor alpha, which is basically an integral over the, the energies between mu and lambda. You can see that this will be uh, logarithmically divergent when small d is equal to 2. 
that's the infrared divergence that you have in four dimensions. And in uh, more than four dimensions, this will just be some polynomial in the two infrared scales, okay? And then the remaining piece is just a d-dimensional integral over this soft factor that we encountered in the soft photon theorem. So this is not the usual way that gamma is written, but it's the most convenient way to sort of uh, make the sort of co-dimension two flavor of the degree of freedom manifest. Okay, and I already said when d is greater than two, there's no higher divergence. When d is equal to two, gamma blows up logarithmically, which is why scattering amplitudes with a finite number of photons just vanish. That's the infrared divergence. Okay, so our goal is to reproduce this structure on this slide using a purely d-dimensional model. Okay, and the idea is going to be to exploit the asymptotic symmetry structure of gauge theory and gravity to kind of pin down what type of d-dimensional model it could be. Uh, and, and then we're going to try to do some matching condition to determine the parameters in that model so that we reproduce the d plus two dimensional infrared physics. Okay, uh, are there any questions about the, the approach before I go any further? Great. Okay, so the, the basic cartoon for why this works is the following. So we're calculating scattering amplitudes in the T plus two dimensional bulk using a path integral with a Lorentzian action with and some operator insertions. These are basically the creation and annihilation operators. Uh, the subscript mu means that I'm using an explicit infrared regulator to regulate and evaluate this path integral. So all the fields are taken to have uh, support, energy support larger than mu. And then to isolate the infrared physics, we want to take each field and we separate it into a soft piece. So those are the, the parts of the field which have energy less than lambda and a hard piece which has energy greater than lambda. And then we just try to integrate out all of the hard pieces. So that, you know, that's like a problem in perturbative quantum field theory. It doesn't have a universal answer, uh, but in models with hard soft factorization, it's just going to give you some non-universal correlation function, which depends explicitly on the scale lambda that you chose, okay? And then you will be left over with an integral, path integral over these soft fields, phi sub s. Uh, okay, and sort of the, the point is going to be, so we want to basically pin down what is this, what is this remaining path integral over the soft fields, and how is it that it can reproduce the infrared divergence. Uh, and there's kind of two key points to this formula. One is that I'm going to assume that this soft path integral actually has a Euclidean effective action because we've seen previously that it's really a Euclidean CFTD, which is showing up in all of this analysis. <clears throat> and I'm going to separate the action into basically two parts. One, as soft, which basically just describes the self-interactions of these soft modes. And the second piece, as int, as interaction, which is going to describe the coupling of these long wavelength modes to the hard external particles in the scattering states. So what's going to happen is that all of these hard external states, they're going to basically act as classical sources uh, for these soft modes. Okay, and they'll be encoded basically in terms of this source J. Okay, I need to speed up just a little bit. Okay, so if we if we go back and we and we look at the general form of the infrared divergence in abelian gauge theory, we basically need a path integral with some sources that evaluates to e to the minus gamma, okay? <clears throat> and if we, as Nemo was asking earlier, if we have an amplitude that also has multiple soft photons in the external states that corresponds to inserting a bunch of these soft operators in the path integral, then we need to produce e to the minus gamma times a product of all of these different soft factors. Is that clear, Nima? 
So this this is basically the formula yes. That, yes. Yes. that you were asking about previously. And this is what we require. So this is sort of our matching condition. And now yes. we want to use this as a constraint to determine the form of this action and the relevant degrees of freedom. Okay, and the, the point is going to be that the left-hand side over here, the form of the action and the relevant degrees of freedom is really fixed by symmetry considerations. All the only thing that won't be fixed is the coupling constants, and we'll just fix those by matching onto the right-hand side, which we, which we know from perturbative quantum field theory. Okay. Okay. Uh, so just very briefly, uh, the the kind of philosophy for this last part of the calculation. So you know, symmetries in quantum field theory they can be approximate or they can be exact. If they're exact, then they can be either spontaneously broken or unbroken, depending on the phase that you're in depending on the nature of the vacuum state. So sometimes it's useful to treat an approximate symmetry as if it were exact, okay? And then if the exact, if the model with the exact symmetry lies in the broken phase and the, the breaking term is small, then you can use these pseudo Goldstone bosons to reliably approximate the low energy dynamics. So there will be symmetry breaking terms in the action for the gold stones, but you can still use that action to reliably compute things in the model. So you can just think about, you know, pions in the chiral Lagrangian. Okay, so in our case, the symmetry group that we're interested in is the group of gauge transformations with non compact support, because they're the ones that act uh, trivially on the Hilbert space in these models. So I'm going to call that huge infinite dimensional symmetry curly G. It has a subgroup, which is the, the quote unquote constant gauge transformations, which represent the unbroken uh, part of the symmetry group. So in abelian gauge theory, that would just be the constant U1 phase rotations for charged particles. And this curly G would be all of the gauge transformations which had non-trivial angular dependence at spatial infinity. And the claim is that all of those are spontaneously broken down to the global U1 group. Okay, as I just said, so the curly G is broken down to the, the global G. And so you expect that the extreme low energy dynamics of these basically infinite wavelength photons is going to be controlled by curly G mod G Goldstone bosons. Okay. Um, let me skip this discussion. It's just making the point that um, you know you can't really talk about either of these groups on a compact manifold. So you really need a Cauchy slice, which either has a boundary or goes off to infinity in order to be able to even define curly G and G, basically because the current which generates them is exact. So the charge is a boundary term. So if you don't have any boundary, then all of these symmetries act trivially and there's nothing interesting. Um, but that's an important point because gauge theories suffer from infrared issues. So, you know, when you do perturbative calculations in gauge theory and gravity, you have to regulate long wavelength fluctuations. Um, and any method that you use to regulate the infrared divergence, you know, photon mass, dim reg, finite volume regularization, something like that, it explicitly breaks or changes this, uh, this asymptotic symmetry group. So the effective action for these Goldstone modes in the regulated theory uh, can also contain symmetry breaking terms, which are basically controlled by the infrared regulator. So we have to consider not just Goldstone bosons, but actually pseudo Goldstone bosons associated to a symmetry with both spontaneous and explicit breaking. Okay. so. Uh, you know, just as a side comment, that's actually the exact same symmetry breaking pattern which is encountered in JT gravity. And there, the Schwarzschild mode is really the diff S1 mod SL2 pseudo Goldstone boson associated to the infrared divergence in ADS2 space times. And we're going to see basically the exact same structure in asymptotically flat gravity and gauge theory in asymptotically flat space. Um, Okay, maybe I can just, um, I guess out of time, maybe I can just try to wrap up in five minutes. This last Sure, question. sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so in gauge theory, the, the symmetry group that we're discussing 
uh, is just this group of large gauge transformations. So it's the gauge transformations which don't die off at spatial infinity. They have non-trivial dependence on the boundary. Uh, so it's really just maps from the d-dimensional sphere onto uh, u1, okay? And the constant maps are the ones which are unbroken, all right? Uh, so you can already see from the form of the symmetry group that it is effectively d-dimensional, not d plus two-dimensional. And so if you're writing down a model which is supposed to non-linearly realize the symmetry, it's very likely that it is actually going to have a d-dimensional flavor rather than d plus two dimensional flavor. That's basically why this works. Okay, so the relevant degree of freedom is basically some gauge field edge mode evaluated at the conformal boundary. It's effectively d-dimensional uh, and it non-linearly realizes this g-symmetry just by the shifts, right? This is the normal transformation for the gauge field. Uh, under a gauge transformation, the only difference is that this epsilon has support all the way out at infinity. Okay. <clears throat> so if we don't have an infrared regulator, the symmetry is exact but spontaneously broken. So, you know, what would the effective action look like? Uh, it has to be written in terms of this edge mode C, which nonlinearly realizes the symmetry. But the action has to be invariant under this infinite dimensional symmetry group. That sounds kind of funny. But if you think about it long enough, you'll realize that that's just a d-dimensional abelian gauge theory where you don't quotient by the gauge transformations, okay? Uh, and in, since C is actually a flat connection, you don't want to integrate over all abelian connections, just the flat ones. So actually it's, it's an abelian BF theory which has the right symmetries and the appropriate domain of integration uh, to match the symmetries and degrees of freedom from the d plus two dimensional gauge theory. So this, uh, this is a model which nonlinearly realizes the symmetry, it has the right degrees of freedom, but it's kind of trivial because you just integrate out B that says F equal to zero and there's no interesting uh, soft dynamics. Uh, however, because we need to put in an infrared regulator, which explicitly breaks the symmetries, there can be symmetry breaking terms in this action as well. And so the fact that it's being realized as a d-dimensional gauge theory means that the symmetry breaking terms, they're just non-gauge invariant terms, which depend explicitly on C rather than as curvature. Okay. Uh, and yeah, one, one last point is just that, uh, you know, in normal effective field theory, the two assumptions that you use are the symmetry breaking pattern and locality. Now here, we're basically trying to write down a lower dimensional model which reproduces higher dimensional uh, effects. So it's not actually guaranteed that this model has to be local. Um, so we kind of want to relax that assumption a little bit and write down to sort of the most general uh, symmetry breaking term that we can. So we'll just put in some propagator for this field C. If it was a local propagator, then this would just be a mass term for the gauge field, but we'll leave it completely general for now. Um, and integrating out B in the BF term still just enforces the flatness constraint on this field C. So C is just the derivative of some scalar theta and this mass term for c basically just becomes a kinetic term for the gauge parameter so we have something that looks like a compact boson in d dimensions okay and this action explicitly breaks the curly g symmetry but is invariant under the u1 transformations um okay so that's that's going to be the ansatz for the soft part of the action we also need to determine what the interaction part of the action is. So that's the one which couples these soft modes to the non-fluctuating background sources, which are produced by the external particles. And you can basically fix that by symmetry considerations as well, because you know how those external uh, hard particles transform under this uh, huge symmetry group. So this was worked out in a series of papers from five years ago. Um, 
but the point is just that they act as phase rotations with a uh, gauge parameter epsilon. And if they're massive particles, then there's some, some integral over a bulk to boundary propagator. If they're massless particles, this is just a delta function. And so the operator just transforms with the phase e to the iq epsilon, okay? So sorry that this is a little bit fast, but uh, so this transformation law basically tells you that you just need to insert the exponential of one of these terms that couples theta to the background source uh, for each particle. So you're gonna get an interaction term, which looks like theta coupled to a bunch of these uh, sources for the, uh, for the abelian current, essentially. And because this bulk to boundary propagator uh, had a representation as the divergence of this current, we can actually write this interaction term as a coupling of C to just this single background J. Okay, so that looks very familiar. It looks like there's just some background current J sourcing this gauge field C, which is kind of what you would expect. Okay, so then, so we fixed the form of the two pieces of the, uh, the soft action, uh, and we're left basically with the Gaussian path integral. So the, that we can evaluate exactly. I, I don't want to discuss it because I'm out of time, but you can evaluate it exactly and just match onto the infrared divergence, which was e to the minus gamma, and that will fix exactly the the propagator that we had in this uh, soft action to begin with. Okay, so if you do that, you get a concrete form for this propagator. And the kind of interesting fact is that it's non-local. It involves this integral over a point, and then these two factors of the conformally covariant tensor divided by the distance squared. And that's basically there to turn these small j's into the curly J, which was the shadow transform of small J, right? So we had this relation between curly J, which was the matrix element of the soft operator, and small J, which was the matrix element of the conserved current. And basically what this propagator does is to shadow transform both of these small J's into curly J's so that we reproduce A1, okay? Uh, and so basically what you can show is that the soft action, uh, although it looks non-local in terms of this edge mode C, it actually has a completely local expression in terms of the shadow edge mode C tilde. Okay, so, so this sort of space-time degree of freedom, the, the one that you get from looking at the S matrix, looks like it has kind of a non-local uh, dynamics but it's secretly just uh, the shadow transform of a field with local dynamics. Um, and that's kind of the big, the big interesting surprise is that actually we're able to write down a D-dimensional model which computes these infrared effects and it has actually local dynamics. Um, okay, and then you can actually write the interaction term in terms of the, uh, the shadow transform as well. So this is the, the full answer for the soft action written in terms of this field C tilde and this background source term J, which was the, the term that showed up in the soft theorem. Um, and so the, this might be a hint that the appropriate set of local operators in the celestial conformal field theory are the shadow transforms of bulk operators. That's still an open question. Okay, let me, I'll just skip this last piece of the calculation, but it's uh, just showing that you can also uh, find the model which calculates matrix elements that have soft insertions. You basically just have to integrate in a second field which corresponds to the external soft photons. But in the interest of time, I'll skip that. So let me just con conclude really quickly. Uh, so. We, we basically found a model which is intrinsically d-dimensional, which computes soft exchange in d plus two-dimensional uh, gauge theory. Actually, the exact same thing uh, happens in gravity. So there, there's this asymptotic symmetry group, which is called the BMS group. 
And the standard claim in the literature is that that is spontaneously broken on the vacuum. And what we showed is that actually, if you include the sort of leading order symmetry breaking term for those Goldstone modes, you actually also produce the infrared divergence uh, in gravitational theories. So that's kind of a proof that the BMS group plays a role in quantum gravity in any number of dimensions. We also explore the construction for models with magnetic charges. And in those examples, the sort of winding symmetry of the compact bosons just gets mapped on to the magnetic charge and the gauge theory. So that was a very natural correspondence. And finally, kind of the thing which we would still like to do, but which is much more difficult, is the non-abelian case. So we're pretty confident in the symmetry uh, arguments in, in this story, and the symmetry considerations will still constrain the pseudo-Goldstone action for the infrared divergences and non-abelian gauge theory. Um, but in that case, both the Goldstone path integral and the bulk yang mills path integral can only be computed in perturbation theory and they're much more difficult to compute. So you might be able to compare a couple of low orders in perturbation theory, um, but the non-perturbative answer is actually going to be much different. So in sort of a best case scenario, you might be able to use some knowledge about the non-perturbative uh, behavior of the lower dimensional pseudo-Goldstone bosons to understand something about the non-perturbative behavior of the higher dimensional gauge theory but that's still something which is going to require a lot more work. Uh, yeah, so I'll stop there. Sorry for going over, but I hope it was clear. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, are there any questions for Dan? Uh, I have a naive question. I think you will, I mean, you probably want to do this also in string theory because that would have maybe a dual or something. Yeah, there have actually been uh, a decent number of papers trying to um, to take this uh, Mellon transform, so this conformal basis, and apply it to string theory amplitudes. And actually, it actually works best there because, as I said, you're doing an integral basically over all energies and most uh, or a lot of local quantum field theories will not have good ultraviolet behavior so those integrals are not guaranteed to converge but in string theory you actually get very nice soft uv behavior uh, and so these these integrals actually do converge and give you very nice interesting answers um, so i think uh, Tomas taylor and some of his collaborators have been writing papers where they take sort of standard string theory amplitudes and, and transform it into this conformal basis and they get interesting answers. There hasn't been any work on the infrared divergences because for that you have to go down to four dimensions to really see. But uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, there are definitely quite a few people who are interested in trying to apply this story to sort of string theory and asymptotically flat space. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I also have a question. Do you mind going a few slides back where you had the shadow edge mode? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's very intriguing that this shadow edge mode like asks for an interpretation in a sense. So it's a thing that couples to J of A, right? Mm -hmm. And in the gravitational example, it's a thing that couples to that stress tensor thing that you define on the boundary, right? Actually, um, not quite. So there's, a, there's an analog of curly J for the leading soft graviton theorem. So it's basically a two index symmetric traceless uh, function, basically DADB of a logarithm. So basically just one more derivative than this thing has. Um, that's the thing which couples to the shadow transform of the leading soft graviton operator and produces the infrared divergence. The stress tensor is related to the subleading soft graviton uh, operator. So that's sort of the order one piece when you take uh, the graviton to have small energy. And so because it has better behavior, it doesn't have the one over omega pole, it actually doesn't give you any infrared divergences. But the suspicion is that um, you could probably still write down a d-dimensional model, which resums that piece of the soft expansion as well. Um, 
It wouldn't be infrared divergent even in four dimensions, but it probably will be universal just because that term is also basically controlled by symmetry. And so it, that term will actually probably look something like the Schwarzschild action because it's supposed to basically uh, be the action for a nonlinear uh, realization of the like the Virasoro group, for instance, in, in four dimensions. So that's what some people have suggested. I don't think anybody has managed to actually do the calculation yet. It's hard because it's effectively non-abelian. So that that term basically is related to angular momentum which is not abelian, whereas the energy and translations is abelian. So that calculation is much more difficult. I think it's definitely something which can be done and probably should be done, but I don't think anybody has understood it yet. So just out of curiosity, is this why you, is this part of the motivation for generalizing this to this to non-abelian cases? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, kind of the, the motivation for here was to, to really just kind of see, you know, what is it that is d-dimensional about d plus two-dimensional gauge theory and gravity? And we kind of have a partial answer here. So you, you sort of expected that the low energy stuff should be d-dimensional because uh, sort of zero energy stuff, you just like integrate along the null direction at scry and you just get rid of that direction that projects onto the zero energy states and it's sort of almost obviously d-dimensional. The question is like, once you move away from the very low energy stuff, is it still sort of effectively d-dimensional? And I think that would be sort of if you can cook up a model which is sort of exponentiating this IR finite but still universal soft exchange in gravity, that would be even more support. But it's hard because that problem is almost as hard as doing the non-abelian gauge theory case because it's it's basically non-abelian perturbation theory, so it's just much more technically involved. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, Prahar and I have, have thought a little bit about it, and we will probably try to do it at some point. Are there any other questions for Dan? If not, let's thank Dan again. And thanks so much for uh, giving the talk. This was wonderful. Yeah, we'll yeah. post the video on. Yeah, thanks for.